There you go. Our mission, Helping Parents Heal is a nonprofit organization dedicated to assisting bereaved parents to become shining light parents by providing support and resources to aid in the healing process. We go a step beyond other groups by allowing the open discussion of spiritual experiences and evidence for the afterlife in a non-dogmatic way. Affiliate groups welcome everyone, regardless of religious or non-religious background, and allow for open dialogue. Attendance today at this meeting is voluntary, and we are here for the benefit of learning from and sharing with other parents whose child has passed away. It is understood that our discussions are intended to be confidential and not designed to replace traditional therapy or spiritual counseling. Helping Parents Heal offers a wide variety of speakers to allow parents to be informed about many possible ways to heal, to connect with their children, and to learn about the afterlife. The views expressed by our guests do not necessarily reflect those of Helping Parents Heal, and we ask that you take from their presentations whatever may benefit you personally. Thank you, Irene. And I'd like to introduce Teresa. I am, so, again, I am so grateful that she's here all the way from London. Uh, Teresa Chung has been researching and writing about the afterlife, angels, and dreams for the past 25 years. She has a master's degree from King's College, Cambridge U University in theology and English, and several international best-selling books, including two Sunday Times top 10 bestsellers to her credit. Her dream dictionary A to Z regularly bounces to number one in its Amazon category and is regarded as a classic in its field. And two of her angel titles hit the Sunday Times top 10. Her spiritual books have been translated into over 40 languages and she has written numerous features for national newspapers and magazines. Her media appearances include an interview with Pierce Morgan on GMTV and guesting on episode 71 of Russell Brand's Under the Skin podcast and Decoding Dreams Live on Coast to Coast AM. She works closely with scientists studying consciousness and has her own popular spiritual podcast, White Shores. Her website is www.teresachung.com. That's spelled C-H-E-U-N-G. And she has a busy author page on Facebook as well as an author page on Instagram and Twitter. Please go to Teresa's website for more information. And I just want to say that she's delightful. I'm thrilled to have her here. And we're going to have Doris Aquaviva, who's our uh, Helping Parents Heal Northeast Atlanta affiliate leader, just say a few words about her before we get started. So Doris, let's see here. Um, have to make sure that you can unmute. There we go. Yeah, I came across Teresa on a podcast with um, Simon Brown, and I was just, I, I had to watch it I had to listen to it twice because it just made me feel so good. Like the work that you're doing is just, it's so healing and so uplifting. And I just, I just love you. I think you're awesome. And that's why I had woke up the next morning. I might've even still been in bed and texted Elizabeth and said, Oh my God, you have to get her. <laughs> so I, I didn't know you had your own podcast though. That's the first I heard of that. I'm going to have to look that one up for sure. But yeah, I'm so grateful that you're here and I'm really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Well, and thank you, Doris. And what we're going to do is have Teresa talk about her journey and talk about um, obviously, she's an academic, she's highly educated and, and moving into this world of the afterlife community. And um, as she does, first of all, I want to make sure that everybody uh, writes their names, where they're from, if they're an affiliate leader, a caring listener, or on the board. And also, if, if questions come up, during the time that she's speaking, please write them in the chat box and I'd love to field them. And Doris might be, be fielding some as well. So uh, without further ado, please welcome Teresa Chun. Hello. Hi, can you hear me all right? Yes, I can hear you. Beautiful, yes. 
Isn't that the wonders of technology? Here I am in the UK and thank you everyone. I'm sorry it was a bit earlier than usual, but it's just simply because of COVID here and I wouldn't get the internet, the time, the space and the quiet to, that, that you deserve. Um, and I just wanna thank you, Elizabeth, Irene and Doris, thank you so much. Um, in particular, Doris, it's, it's wonderful that you, you did this because otherwise I wouldn't be connected to this amazing organization. And I'm, I'm absolutely, I'm getting a bit tearful actually because you said such kind things about me and it shouldn't be about me at all. It should be about you because I'm what I'm seeing here in the faces. And that's what I often see in the faces of bereaved people, and particularly with children, is that youth, that joy, which is such a contradiction to what you would expect for someone who's been through, let's face it, the hardest thing you can ever experience, the loss of a beloved child at whatever stage, whether it's in pregnancy or in life um, on earth, um, it's the toughest thing and my respect goes out to you. In fact, I feel you should be talking to me about the spiritual journey because I have not been through that. I have, of course, as most people have, especially when you get to my age, lost people I thought I couldn't live without. And so I can talk from it from that perspective. I've also written books about the loss of children, angel babies, I have researched it and I get lots and lots of letters uh, from people who are having afterlife signs and experiences. Plus I work with scientists who are researching all this. So that's what I can offer. Um, I can't however offer what you guys have been through and are going through every day, which is such a difficult journey. But I just look at you and Elizabeth, look, the, the, the glow, there's beauty, beauty, there's youth. And it, it's so sad that you had to go through that darkness to, to get there, but I'll talk about that in the talk. But also I'm going to say, I did actually expect the, the, um, the, uh, <laughs> this to be an interview. So I'm just going to be speaking from my heart here. So forgive me if I ramble and go on a tangent and I, as I'm known to do, and anyone who listens to my podcast, I think that's what they tune in for is what is she going to say next? <laughs> But that's how I believe heaven works. And in a way, I'm glad that I didn't know this because you have to expect the unexpected when you go on the spiritual path. That's what it's all about. So I'm really glad. So I'm just going to take a deep breath and speak from my heart. And I hope that what I say helps or is informative or open minds or encourages you to connect to other people because I'm gonna suggest some names of people I've worked with as well that you may or may not know of before who can maybe help and heal as well. Um, I will do a very brief, brief introduction to who I am because I'm sure that there are lots of people who don't know who I am. Um, um, so I'm gonna do that. Not because I think I'm the big I am or anything, but just to show you why I'm doing this work that I'm doing. I was born into a family of spiritualists um, and psychics in, in the UK. Um, um, however, I didn't feel I inherited the gift. And can you imagine how hard that is when you're born into a family of people who are regularly talking to dead people or seeing angels? And I was like, I'm not seeing anything. What's wrong with me? Um, but what that did is it gave me a passion and a hunger to learn about what I was witnessing. Because I would, from the age of about three or four, would be in demonstrations of mediumship where I would see how a medium would offer healing and hope. I would see as a child, someone crying and smiling at the same time. And that, I remember that was such a powerful image of, of, of the spiritual journey. And so what happened as I got older, although I didn't have that, ability, well, I didn't think I had, and that's what I talk about. I think we all have that ability to connect to the other side, but I had to learn that the hard way through the school of hard knocks. But what I got from an early age was this hunger to learn. And that led me, despite difficult circumstances, to get a privileged place at Cambridge where I read theology and learned about religion. And, but during that time, I realized that one religious path wasn't the answer. I mean, I was very Christian focused when I went there, but then I kind of stepped out of that and saw every religion as beautiful because I studied all religions there. And I began to realize that they're all paths to the same beautiful goal, spiritual goal. And I just kept on that researching when I left. And this led to book after book about 
paranormal and spiritual experiences. And a lot of those books were actually me saying, well, it's not happening to me. I haven't got a connection, but here's what people are telling me. Now, in any other academic realm, in any other sphere of work, if you had this amount of witness statements, and that's what they are, it would be regarded as data. And it frustrated me that everybody was saying, well, it's delusion, it's nonsense, it's imagination. And, but the people that were writing to me were from all walks of life. I would have parents, I would have mothers and fathers, and, but also siblings, and, but every career as well, teachers, law enforcement officers, barristers, politicians. I started to get letters from people who were having some kind of afterlife sign and not understanding it. And typically they'd write to me saying, am I going mad? I don't actually believe in an afterlife, but this is what happened to me. And so what I was able to do, and I'm eternally grateful that my academic credentials enabled me to do that with publishing, was to present it to my editors and to create book after book with Simon and Schuster. I believe I published 12 with them, or is it 10? I can't remember, 10 of afterlife story collections. And all of those did better and better and better, even going to the Sunday Times, it was incredible. And I felt so privileged and honored to be in this opportunity, this position. But then what happened is that I felt this isn't enough just gathering the stories together. I wanted to find out the science. And that led me on a long and winding path to work with scientists. And I ended up teaming up with IONS, the Institute of Noetic Sciences, which you mentioned, who very kindly agreed to do some videos on my author page about their work. When I put those, author vid those videos of the scientists and I said to them, your scientists, look, please don't use jargon because nobody's gonna get it. Can you talk in normal language? Now, most of them were able to do that. A couple of them were just so in the realms of science, it was very hard and I had to sort of decode it. But that week there was like half a million views to these scientists, it was like nobody had ever heard about the science behind paranormal and psychic experiences. And then I realized I was onto something. And ever since then, because I did this, about, did this about seven or eight years ago now, I've, I've heavily promoted the science of the paranormal and said, look, there are scientists out there taking these experiences seriously. Can we stop dismissing it all as nonsense? Um, and I also, I was able to get to national new, newspapers like the Daily Mail, who did this double page feature saying intelligent people who believe in the afterlife. It was ridiculous. And they held me up as an intelligent, I was, you know, everybody's intelligent in my opinion. But, you know, th there was a barrister there, a prison officer and a teacher who were all saying that they had afterlife signs. And it had a phenomenal reaction and it led to another feature. And then I went on to team up with Dr. Julian Mossbridge, who's leading the world in uh, precognition study and research and wrote a book called The Premonition Code, which was about potentially gl glimpsing the future, but also that we are eternal spiritual beings. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to put it on the map and get rid of all this mumbo jumble because it frustrated me so much in the early days of my writing career that every time a feature was done about me, they put a crystal ball in front of me. Like I was some kind of witch or, 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 you know, I'm not psychic, that's what I was saying. However, what has happened, and I'm sure everyone here will recognize this, although I haven't had blinding visions of angels, they don't jump out of my hair, I don't see angels and I don't see dead people like in the movie Sixth Sense. What has happened is I have had incredible dreams of people I have loved and lost. And I didn't realize it at the time, but those dreams were afterlife signs. And I did some research into this and found Dr. Cal Cooper in the University of Northampton, who has been collating studies of dreams of the bereaved, including parents who's lost their children and parents who dream of their departed children tend to deal better with the grieving process. And I realized then that dreams are actually the first point, point of contact. And there's a reason why spirits of departed loved ones choose that because they're least likely to cause alarm. So whenever people say to me, look, I'm 
I've lost someone, but then I'm getting no sign like I used to do. I say, have you dreamt of them? And they say, yeah, that's just a dream. I say, absolutely not. Not, not just a dream. And I've actually done so much research now and writing about the dreaming mind that I actually believe our dreaming mind is spirit and it's where we connect to the afterlife. And I'm doing a lot of work with lucid dreaming techniques, dreams of the bereaved. And that's where my focus is actually right now and looking at uh, the dreams of the bereaved. So I say, first of all, to people who are grieving, look to your dreams, because that's the first place, because it's a safe place for them to reach out to you. And you will know when you've had a night vision, as I call it, where a connection with the other side, because the dream will feel incredibly vivid and real. And I'm going to reference my own experience there. When my, that's my first big bereavement was when I was in my early thirties, my mother died and I had no sign and I plummeted into depression because I felt I had devoted my life to researching the afterlife, but I was getting nothing from her. I mean, I did expect a blinding vision. I expected her to walk through the door and I to see a vision. I was that naive. I'm ashamed to say I was because that's what you led to believe in the movies, aren't you, and everything. But then what happened about six months in when I was my lowest point, I had this very vivid dream of her. In that dream, nothing spectacular happened. She simply walked into my bedroom and started tidying it. And it was so vivid and realistic. She didn't say anything to me. And when I woke up the next morning, it was almost like she was still alive again. Of course, it, only a few minutes later, I realized it was a dream and, and the pain came back. But it was the start of a healing journey. One dream at a time, I started small steps to get my life together and, and deal with the grieving process and establish a connection in spirit. My dreams taught me that she was alive somewhere. And one of those dreams, and that also formed the basis of one of my books, I believe actually saved my life because I met her in a dream and she told me to take the right path. And then the following day I was at a junction and I, and I, I heard that dream in my mind again and I took the right path and I truly believe if I hadn't taken the right path, I would have faced certain death. I can't prove that. But for me, it felt like she was speaking to me in a dream, giving me a warning. And I've since had dreams of other people I've lost and loved, loved and lost. And in my dreams, they are alive. And I, especially during the pandemic now, because I'm getting so much media interest in my work because of the pandemic. I, since March this year, you would not believe the organizations that have been in touch with me to ask me to do dream webinars, to explain all this dreaming people are doing in the pandemic. It's called the pandemic, um, the, the lockdown dream phenomenon. Um, people are dreaming more vividly and frequently because of the pandemic than ever before. And sleep and dream researchers are trying to understand why. And I'm sure you all know, because you're all spiritual experts, you know why we're all dreaming vividly. It's an afterlife sign. It's spirit breaking through, trying to show us our shared humanity, because whoever we are, whatever our beliefs, whatever our religion, we all dream. We all dream. And I believe the lockdown dream phenomenon, which is being written about, researched scientifically, is spirit breaking through. That's my personal opinion. But to return to bereavement, I believe dreams are the first port of call. And if you only get a dream of a loved one, I say only because I think dreams are extraordinary, that is proof of survival. Because what are dreams? We don't know. I've worked with neuroscientists and scientists researching what dreams are. There are theories but none of them are proven and they don't know. But one interesting study on dreaming really gripped me because when we are deprived of REM sleep, that's rapid eye movement sleep when most dreaming occurs, when deprived of that, depression and anxiety is common. And when these studies are sadly done on animals, lifespan is decreased which led me to think rather radically that perhaps the reason we sleep, because get this, scientists don't even know why we sleep, it's not to rest, because we're very active 
physically and mentally in our sleep. We don't even know why we sleep, but perhaps one of the reasons we dream, we, we sleep is because we need to dream, that dreams are essential for our survival. And as I say, I believe that in our dreams, we go to some kind of unseen, invisible realm of spirit. And learning to decode and understand our dreams can be the first step to spiritual awakening. We need to learn to, to interpret our dreams because when we dream, we dream in the language of symbols and we need to understand that. I know I'm, I'm jumping all over the place here. As I said, this, this is not prepared, but this is what I've been talking about. I've had, as I said, you know, companies like Anthropology, you know, very material beauty bay, wanting me to explain to them, why are we all dreaming now? And I've been, you know, national newspapers, I went on coast to coast because of this, and I've never had so much interest. And I think actually it is spirit trying to break through and remind us that we are more than the material. Now you of course will know that because you've all been through this horrendous journey of losing a child. I don't know why that happened. I wish I could explain. I don't know the mind of spirit, um, but perhaps in the afterlife, we will understand when we transition to spirit ourselves. At the moment, we're in this life, which is all like the underside of a tapestry, all knots and messy ends. And maybe it's only on the other side and in spirit when we turn over and we see the picture and we understand why you lost something so precious to you. Um, but from to return to the theme of this, which is stories of people who have written to me about afterlife signs they have received from children in spirit. They are incredible, these stories stories of children breaking through first through dreams but also through signs through nature through the words of other people this is how these stories come through and every time these signs come through the parent knows knows with a certainty an unshakable certainty that this is not their imagination this is their child reconnecting to them and they, it can eat, the child can also reconnect through your belief that that child is alive. I know this is very difficult to understand, but your child, every time you think of that child, every memory you have, your child becomes alive within you again. Because I hate the grief therapy process where you've got to get over it. I know if you've lost a child, you never want to get over it. And I never tire actually of quoting that William Wordsworth poem, We Are Seven, where William Wordsworth is talking to a child by a grave and he asks her, what's she doing there? And it's the grave of um, a sister or a brother that she's lost. And um, he asks how many other sisters and brothers she's got and she goes seven and he goes through it. And it's clear that the one, there's one or two children missing because they're in the grave. But the child insists, no, we are seven. And the child will play by the grave and, and talk to the, it's a beautiful poem. If you ever check it out, it's called We Are Seven. It's about the stubborn insistence that sometimes children will know. To children, it seems absolutely obvious if you have other children, that when you talk about departed loved one, there's no sense that this child is departed. This child is alive. And I had one wonderful story, which really struck to me uh, from a father actually, because a lot of stories I got are actually from the men who are not actually supposed to talk about all this, but I'm very honored that they wrote to me and he had a child that was stillborn, but they never told their other child about it. They completely hid all knowledge of that because it was too painful, understandable. However, four years later, when this child went to school, they, he kept bringing pictures back where there was another child and they put the letter D on that child and the child that was stillborn was called Daniel. And there's no way that that child could have known. So this father was taught through his own child and then there was an emotional conversation where you actually have a brother in spirit. And the beautiful stories I get like that, which make me cry and smile at the same time. And that for me is the mark of spirit when you can both cry and smile at the same time. 
as I said earlier, and I gathered these stories all together. But as I said, I wanted more. I didn't just want the anecdotal because as, ma as wonderful as that is at the anecdotal stories that I can give you, I can give you hundreds of them, thousands maybe, my mailbag bag when people were writing letters was huge now of course it's all messaging on social media and and um, through email is phenomenal I have a database and um, I've actually been contacted by people doing PhD research on this wanting stories so I freely share my database to show what how many just how many people are having afterlife signs and experiences or simply believing that their child or their loved one has not gone but belief maybe isn't enough especially in this day and age where the you know personal belief the anecdote experience experience as powerful as it is is not enough and that's why i have gone on a crusade to my detriment you know it's not been easy because publishers don't like it they want me to just publish the comforting anecdotal and they you know because people don't necessarily want the science their eyes glaze over because the science is tough to understand but i will not i'd rather not write a book than now no longer reference the science and as i said ions is leading the way in that and also my collaboration with the Winbridge institute i don't know if you know that dr julie Beischel wrote the foreword to one of my books called answers from heaven um, and i have a very good rapport with her she's also been interviewed on my podcast and that episode was one of the most downloaded where she talked about her research as a medium and i love working with people like that and from, but what i love about them is that they are scientists before they're believers. I mean, I'm sure Dr. Judy Beischel and a lot of the people at IONS are actually believers. They are. But it doesn't matter to them. They say to me their belief comes second. And if the study doesn't prove the paranormal, they're not going to publish it because their integrity as scientists come first. I love that. And that's also why I never tire of following and referencing the work of Dr. Sam Pioneer with his near-death experience research. Now, Dr. Sam Pioneer, he doesn't believe in life after death. He said that he's an atheist. However, he could not deny report after report that was coming through from his patients because he's one of the leading experts in resuscitation. And what was happening that people were coming back with his new equipment that he designed with all these incredible stories. And he thought, this is data. I'm a scientist. I can't pretend it's not happening. I cannot pretend it's not happening. And now there's more ongoing studies about that, which also IONS is looking into as well. And more and more near-death experience stories. I mean, I'm sure you all know Dr. Ivan Alexander who, who actually launched my podcast. He was the very first episode. And he talked about his, his, his near-death experience there. Um, and he's also been in my books, you know, and there's a neuroscientist who had this happen to him. The realization, as he says, as he says, so repeat, never tires of repeating is that the mind, it can exist separate from the brain and the body. Um, and, you know, you've got the Galileo Commission, IONS, the Windbridge Institute, Soul Phone Technology. I don't know if you know those guys. You mentioned <laughs> Gary Schwartz, didn't you? We Was know it? them very, very well, actually. Um, yes, and I, I just want to jump in very quickly because I, I, there are a lot of questions, but Nancy is bringing up something that I think is very important. She does not feel like she's dreamed, but she's wondering um, what could the reason be that I rarely dream, even though I do receive a son. I can't wait to answer son. this. <laughs> she does dream. She's just not recalling it. Yes. Everybody dreams. I mean, there are people in my life who say to me, I don't dream. It's I don't remember them. It's, you're just not recalling it. And there's certain things you can do to turn that around. Stress, obviously, and I don't know where you are in your bereavement journey, is a big dream blocker because you're overwhelmed with emotion and stress and it's going to take time. So be patient with yourself as well. Don't try and force dreams. They're gentle and subtle. They will come when you are ready that maybe the grieving process needs to work itself out because I'm a firm believer that grief is a journey, a horrific journey, however, one that where we learn more about ourselves and what matters in this life than anything. It is spiritual awakening like no other. And I almost in a way, this sounds weird, feel sorry for people who haven't suffered a bereavement because it does 
make you understand why we're here and what the meaning and purpose of our life. So you need to go through that journey. However, if you're not recalling your dreams, you simply aren't paying enough attention to them. Think more about the possibility of dreaming because like anything in life, the more attention you pay to something, the more it will reward you. Perhaps for years, you've got used to dismissing your dreams as nonsense or random or meaningless. And, you know, your brain listens, you know, your mind listens to you, the messages you, you pay, pay to it. So start believing in the possibility that you can dream, start paying attention to them. And in time, your dreams will reward it. Also, put a pen and paper by your bed before you go to sleep. That ritual is almost like a prompt to your dreaming mind. Do it every night. Keep doing it for at least three weeks. And I guarantee you within three weeks, because that's often how long it takes to reset your thought patterns, you will start having dreams. And then the moment you wake up and have an image in your mind, write it down. Because if you don't, you will forget. You probably are waking up with dream memories, but then maybe you go to the restroom or you get up or you stretch. Any kind of movement or interaction with the physical world, you will lose those memories. You need to write them down. If no image comes to mind, what feeling, however, painful or dark that feeling is, write it down because the chances are, you know, dreams speak in the language of symbols and feelings that that's what's been happening in your dream. So write it down. Writing it down every morning is another dream prompt. Also, just before you go to sleep at night, you're in that twilight zone where the brain enters a theta state. Now the theta state is almost similar to what young children have actually, where you're very impressionable. We have two opportunities in the day to reset our thought processes and to attract, you know, to connect to spirit. And that is just before you go to sleep and just on waking. When the brain is in that state, a highly receptive state, and the messages you fill your mind with at that time can kind of set the tone for your dreams during the night and your day. So that's why I always also say in my, my other books, which maybe aren't about bereavement, when you wake up, try to fill your mind with loving images of people you've loved and lost, happy ones, memories, because in, over time that's really, really going to help. And I know this sounds crass and it's very, very hard to do when you're grieving, but the more you do that, especially just before sleep and early morning, those are sacred times. In monasteries and nunneries, it's the call to prayer, those times, treasure them, because this is when spirit is so close and we don't realize we trash those those opportunities because they're also busy checking our phones or worrying about what happened in the day or in the morning oh i've got what i've got to do just those sacred moments they are truly truly powerful spiritual times so just before sleeping just on waking don't ignore those again and um the more attention basically the more attention you pay to your dreams the more you set the intention before you go to sleep to dream in time Typically, it takes three or four weeks to do this. You will be rewarded with dreams. And I can tell you, when you do have a dream and you meet a departed loved one in your dream, when that happened to me, I still remember the joy. The joy. And I've actually had wonderful conversations with people in, I've loved and lost in my dreams that have been so insightful and informative. There is an unseen invisible world out there that we cannot touch yet in this life, but it is real. There is too much evidence that has been sent to me over the years and now working with scientists for me not to believe otherwise. Um, and uh, if you want to get a representation of what the afterlife is, I actually, a couple of weeks ago, I watched that Robin Williams movie, What Dreams May Come. Watch that over and over. It's so powerful because every medium I've spoken to because I've also done a lot of work with mediums who and people who believe that they visit the other side that dream seem that film seems to be the most the closest representation of what life may be like on the other side that that I and I, I highly recommend it yes I'm writing it in the sidebar and I just want to say that I don't get a lot of dreams from Morgan and my daughter Chelsea but every morning when I wake up, I feel that I've spent time with him. You and have. I that if, I, if I actually spent time writing these things down, I would know. But I, I think that it's important for all of us to understand that they can, they can access us over there. <laughs> a lot easier 
for them. My dog agrees. <laughs> and then also Nancy is saying, I, um, let's see, no, uh, Mary, sorry, is saying, when I have a dream, I use the voice memo on my phone to record it. Perfect. It's easier than writing it down for me, which is true. That's another way of just keeping something beside your bed and being able to uh, write it down. We have a bunch of other questions. Do you mind answering a few? No, no, I love it. And I'm sorry if I've rambled a bit. As I said, it's just my passion. It's been absolutely beautiful. <laughs> and you know what's so interesting is we, we do know Gary, we know Dr. Gary Schwartz. We know about the soul phone. We know about, you know, Mark Pitstick and a lot of oh, other. Mark, have you had Mark Pitstick on here? Okay, well, he, he actually is the head of our caring listeners, and he helps a lot with our group. He does the facilitating. He's got a great sense of humor as well, because I was a bit nervous about speaking to him, because it all seemed so kind of sci-fi. And then when I spoke to him, he was the most funny guest. Uh, he was, not, I mean, in a, in a wonderful way, and that's, that's a mark of spirit to me as well. And that's what I see from your faith, this joy, this lightness, because when you are touched by spirit, something happens, it lifts you. And I can tell, I can oh, tell by the light in the yes. people's eyes. The ki these kids um, are constantly lifting us up. It's like these huge balloons that are that are carrying us forward. And not just Morgan and Chelsea, but every single child here. And and I've told people over and over again, the day that I will be the happiest is the day that I get to hug every single one of these kids. No fear of COVID either. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be absolutely it wonderful. Will, in the other side, it's just like a heartbeat away. There's no sense of time. And for them, they're just, you know, they're, they're there. They, they, they know that they're alive within you. They know. They are there. They are like every time you think about them, whether that's through a dream or a thought or a memory keep that death ends a life not a relationship that's what i t say over and over and over again and well, i to, going forward with what i was saying i've been telling gary schwartz i've been telling mark pitstick ever since morgan passed that the kids have been telling me that the the communication that we have with them is going to ultimately save the world and for a very very long time i thought that sounds very fatalistic what in the world are what am i hearing that doesn't make any sense there's no there's no problem in the world why why would they be saying something like that but now i understand ever since about january of this year i've understood that we need to listen to what they're saying and be more compassionate, be more kind, be, be um, a greater help to our fellow citizens, be on a path of understanding that there's more and not that this life is the only life that we have here. And well, I think that's why the pandemic, in some ways I feel that that's maybe what's positive about the pandemic because we, if you haven't got in a strength, a belief that there is something more, how can you get through this difficult time you know how can you get through it without yeah. that belief and as I said you know the book Man's Search for Meaning Viktor Frankl kind of like sums that up as well that's another book I often recommend even though I'm not religious I don't recommend any kind of religion but it's that inner strength that there is more to this life and there's a part of you that is infinite yes and exactly. it's invisible and unseen and we have denied it and feared it for too long. And I feel absolutely blessed that in this lifetime, because I'm sure I'll be back many times because I'm a flawed human being, I've got lots to learn, that my the reason I wasn't able to Im immediately see dead people or whatever when I was young was because my destiny was to research it, collect stories, be a collector, and also, a lot of people are like me. A lot of people don't have these blinding visions like, you know, these celebrity mediums or whatever have. I'm not sure how I feel about that because, you know, that doesn't really help you if in your life you're not having it. So I feel like my voice is championing the ordinary but extraordinary ways our lost loved ones reach out to us on a daily basis. Ordinary but extraordinary ways through a memory, through a dream, through a coincidence, through a sign, even if that sign's a feather or a robin hopping across your path, the universe speaks to us in all these invisible ways. 
And that's what I, I want to champion. I'm not particularly interested anymore in people who've had astonishing visions or blinding insights or believe they've seen a full blown vision. It's, it, I don't think that's helpful at all. I don't think so because I think spirit wants us to always question, always, because curiosity is so important for evolution and pushing us forward. I think spirit wants us to question and come to our own conclusions through our own experience and through our own life journey. That's what I, I believe. I think that's beautiful. And I think that all of us here are so fortunate and in, in, our, in our very difficult situation that we're in, obviously having a child pass, but we're so fortunate to know that there is more and not to fear death. Um, obviously, I think that we all need to be very careful during this pandemic because we don't want to give it to anyone else. I know. Um, certainly I would know. never want to be the reason that someone else passes. But at the same time, it's, it's not the same thing for us as it would be for someone who doesn't have an incredible son or daughter or more than one son or daughter on the other side or other loved ones who are uh, waiting for us on the other side and who are helping us while we're here. Um, I have other questions though, if it's okay. Galen is asking, is it science and anecdotal evidence only that helps us bridge the gap in conversations with friends and family who do not understand? What else can we do as bereaved parents or shining light parents? Galen's a shining light parent. <laughs> we need to help other people understand what, what you're doing. Yeah. I mean, you've got to one way I say to them, I ask, often ask people who are like saying this is all nonsense, you know, they've gone. Think about who you were when you were a child. Go back in your mind. Remember yourself, say, as 10 years old. Then remember yourself as 18 year old. Now remember yourself as you are now. That child has died, who you were, but you go on. And death is just another stage in our evolution it's the final shedding of the material realm because you you were you at 10 your consciousness was there but the the, the way your, your appearance may have changed and that child has died where's that child gone it's not gone it lives on in you and that exactly what happens on the other side because I often say to people when you go to when you when you go to the afterlife how do you go? Do you go as a baby? Do you go as a 10 year old? Do you go to 20? What age are you? How do you go? And trying to get people to understand that, that there's this infinite part of us that's always there and simply goes on, on the other side. And I've had the privilege to sit with people who've passed over. I did work in a hospice uh, for several years in my, my late teens before I went to Cambridge. And unmistakably, this spark, this consciousness, which, which science yet hasn't been able to create, much as it tries, some light goes out. It goes somewhere. The body is like a coat that someone's taken off. That's the only way I can describe death. Um, so I would say, I encourage them to think of them, themselves and the stages of their own lives, how yet they are still here, but that 10 year old's gone, dead no longer here so that that kind of long body over time which i'm trying to explain also i'm trying i talk to them about thoughts and feelings when you imagine someone and see them in your mind's eye what's going on there what is the purpose of our dreams we don't need them what is the purpose of that you know um all these these questions but i, I guess if somebody's made their mind up there's nothing you can do people have to you grow to spirit you don't go there it's the school of life will take them there if they are meant to. And all we can do is open the door. And that's what my books try and do. I never try and force my beliefs because I think that's terrible. I just try and say, well, look, here's evidence. Here's some thoughts to open your mind. And that's all you can really do, isn't it? Um, for people who feel that way. Um, but at the end of the day, we need that comfort. We need that inner strength, that belief that we are more than this stuff. Of course we are. Of course we are more than this stuff. It's obvious. For me, it feels obvious now. 
I love the fact that you just said that we grow to spirit. We don't go there. I think, uh, I think that that's exactly right. And that's one of the, one of the things about our group too, that we certainly don't want anyone to ever feel that they have to feel any certain mm -hmm. way, first of all, to, to heal, but also to be a part of this group. And there's plenty of time. I mean, I think that if, if people don't get it in this lifetime, they can get it in a future Maybe life. Maybe you're not meant to. I mean, we're all on different paths. You know, as I said, I think I was not meant to get it until, I mean, it's taken me decades to get where I am today, really. Although I've always been fascinated by it. it the, the understanding, the illumination didn't really happen until about 10 years ago. And I've been building on that. Before that, I was a collector, a researcher and still not quite getting it. And it's not until you actually lived and sometimes maturity gets you there. We all on, on a different path and it happens for a reason. All I can say is read, learn, be curious. Because I think as long as you're curious, you're living your meaning. Because the meaning, from what I gather about the afterlife, the learning continues and the meaning of our life here, yes, it's to love and yes, it's to connect, but it's also to learn. Because once you stop learning and you say, there is no life after death, you, you stop yourself. How do you know? That's what I say. How do you know? Have proved to me. And they can't either. Nobody can prove that. You know, their argument is we can't prove it. I think we can. I think we've got near-death experiences. We've got parting visions. We've got afterlife signs. We've got anecdotal evidence. We've got these amazing scientists who are really... I admire them because it must be difficult in the scientific world to do what they're doing. Putting forth this incredible data. And as I say, Dr. Dr. Sampania is leading the way with his near-death experience research, which is making the scientific community really think again. And I absolutely love that. Um, we've got, play actually, we've got more evidence than they have. Prove to me it, it's, it, you know, someone who, for example, has had a dream where they, information has been revealed from the other side that there's no way they could possibly know otherwise or someone who has visited a medium and they've said something that there's absolutely no way this man or woman could have known what is going on there what is going on there oh, that is that is so beautiful and i i think that it's so sad that people want to believe something that ultimately makes them sad instead of making believing something that makes them happy it, it doesn't make sense to me but I I love what you're saying yes and I I have a question from Antoinetta that I think is a very good question you just started talking a little bit about it what is your take on what the afterlife is like my take on it is that it's vibrant and colorful um, one uh, mother wrote to me about her, her daughter actually who died and her daughter was having visions of the afterlife and she said the flowers sing and that's always stuck with me that before the little girl died she said she was going to be happy because she was going where the, where the flowers sing. Oh, it's just beautiful. Vibrancy and colour is what comes and learning. But however, also, you know, what about people who have done wrong on this side? You know, I'm often asked, well, what about criminals? What about murderers? Do they go to this vibrant, colorful place and get the, all that? And I, I believe very much that you go to the kind of afterlife that you're creating right now. Everyone here is already creating the kind of afterlife they will experience with their thoughts. So that when you go to the other side, you really take your heaven with you. And that's why I believe the afterlife could be experienced right now. It's not something that happens when you finally transition. It happens in every single moment. Um, and so when someone who has been bad or done horrible things goes to the other side, they will have to learn how their acts impacted other people. They need to learn empathy. Again, this isn't punishment. The focus is always on learning and growth. It seems that this life is a constant shedding of skins. I use that analogy and, you know, just we, when we shed our physical body, it's just another skin we shed as we move on and to pure spirit. Um, and if you think back in medieval times, you know, saints and everything who fasted in a way, I, I don't recommend it. What they were trying to do is pure spirit. And that's why a lot of people with addictions and everything and um, eating disorders, it's almost like not wanting the physical. This is a very interesting approach to it. 
not to be recommended at all because I think this life is to be enjoyed and to learn from but it's that lightness that just wanting to be pure spirit and if you look at you know a lot of religions they do have fasting for a reason I don't agree with it but I you know I'm going on a tangent oh, again and but... there, are, well, there are other ways to raise our vibration I think just from you know maybe yoga maybe meditation yeah. as, uh, as well as possibly cutting out as much red meat and and maybe even becoming vegetarian doing things that are similar to possibly what they were doing in the fasting. And um, I know that that's helped me in spending lots of time outdoors. I think that that Absolutely. is one of the biggest- well, Nature teaches us about death so much because in, in nature, you see how life and death are one. They both feed in, they are both miracles. And, and it's changing, it, uh, it's stopping to fear death and seeing death as a miracle. Death truly is a miracle. You are, I mean, when you are with people who are close to passing, every moment is so rich with life. It really is. It teaches us to be present in a way, shows us the, etern the infinite eternity of every present moment. But as you say, spending time in nature is so healing because it shows us this life and death are one in nature. They need each other. Um, and that, that's quite a difficult concept to grasp and a painful one. Um, but as I say, the spiritual perspective is the only one that can pull you through. It truly is. Well, I have people thanking Doris for bringing you to us. And Doris, oh, I'm thankful to Doris. I, I, I absolutely love yeah. <laughs> And I was going to say, there's an episode, I'm just thinking, um, I've done a lot of my podcasts it's in season two episode 10 you you won't know her but it's a lady uh, we talk about it um it, her journey where she lost her her four-year-old daughter and she talks about it and the signs that she's experienced i called the episode from cradle to beyond the grave um and it's it got stacks of messages about it it's deeply moving she went on to write her own book about it called the gift within us i'm not sure if it's available in the states but it's a beautiful book and she's an incredibly beautiful woman who speaks about her journey um from losing her child she actually describes the moment it happens and how she's rebuilt her life now um and it's season two episode 10 from cradle to beyond the grave i i i recommend that because it deals directly with child bereavement that's wonderful. But um, Doris is asking, what is your reason for writing Angel Babies? Could you maybe just, um, we have a few more minutes. Um, because of the amount of messages, because I respond very much what happened when I wrote my first book, An Angel Called My Name, about angels. I thought that would be it. Because what I'd done before, I, for HarperCollins, I'd written encyclopedias of the psychic world, because they wanted my academic credentials to do a sort of big encyclopedia of the psychic world. And then I did an encyclopedia of 20,000 dreams. And then they said, well, there's a lot of interest in angels at the moment, you know, angels in my hair and all that, even though you don't see angels, can you write an angel story collection? And I said, yeah, sure, I've got them. Um, and I wrote that first one. It was so successful that they said, we want to follow up. And I just looked at the volume of messages and I would say 60% of them were from parents. And it was in response to that. Um, and so I contacted the parents and asked them if they would not mind sharing their stories and all of them without exception, some of them wanted their names changed for religious or cultural reasons, because I, for no other reason than it will comfort other parents going through it. Now that book was written a while ago and I wish actually I had an opportunity to revisit because I, that's what maturity does, I could write it so much better because I literally just cobbled together my belief in angel babies, you know, how I believe I saw my son in a dream before he was born, showing that I believe this long body over time, um, to all the, and I gathered some of the, I hate to say the best of, but the ones that were most coherent and I believed would speak to most people. Um, and I just collected them together. That was the simple reason. It was in response to the angels that had written to me. Um, and. And then it just led to more and more. As I said, it's always in response to the mail that I get. Um, and I ended up doing about 12 of them at the time, which is incredible. If you think the UK is actually very cynical. And my publishers invested no publicity in it at all. They just thought they were going to sell foreign rights to the book because my 
my angel books are translated all over the world. They didn't even bother. And even they were thinking, how can this be happening? And they were kind of embarrassed of it as well. I'm ashamed to say in publishing, there's often this kind of embarrassment of dealing with these topics. It has changed more recently when you've got the likes of Eben Alexander and more high profile cases coming, but they were kind of embarrassed at the time. They did zero publicity. There was no, I got hard, you know, my advance was so small because they didn't think it would do well. They thought, how can anyone believe this? And yet look at it. And it's just built and built. It's just like going bigger and bigger and bigger. And now I just feel so grateful to be at this time in my career to do that and to be invited on Russell Brand to talk about this. Now he's kind of, <laughs> it was not easy because he made, he, he, you know, if you want to have an exercise in humiliation and how, how to fail at something, <laughs> Have a look at me in that interview. I'm like a rabbit caught in the headlights because this was the first time actually that I'd spoken to someone quite so famous about my beliefs. And it's it's it unintentionally, if you can get the YouTube video, it's on his YouTube, it's hilarious because I'm literally, I'm talking because I was in his garden. He has the studio in his garden and I sat there and he was just saying, well, this is, you know, he was being Russell Brand you know, can imagine the fun, the kind of fun he had with the idea of life after death. But at the end of the interview, I'm pleased to say we somehow came to an understanding and he's actually gone quite spiritual now. I can't take credit for that, but it's a very entertaining interview for all the wrong reasons, but it will make you feel better if you think you make a fool of yourself. Have you ever fallen over in public? That was me. <laughs> but because I fell over in public, it actually meant that the podcast, which they actually thought, because they buried it between Marianne Williamson and uh, with Wim Hof, and they were kind of thinking, well, let's just bury it. But actually it did better than <laughs> because it was so dissonant. But I think ancient spirit did that for a reason. Because, because it was became such a talking point. Because people tuned in, because like, who is this woman? This is going to be funny. But it was overwhelmingly positive at the end. And so many people said, I'd never thought about it in that way. So I was, again, thank you. I was so grateful for the opportunity to do that because it raised awareness of the afterlife in a way. Although I, I will kick myself because when he was talking about the science, I wasn't as clued up as I could be. And I ended up, Nerves quoting Patrick Swayze in Ghost. Not good. The love inside, you take it with you. That wasn't good. <laughs> That's a beautiful movie, though. All of us love that. <clears throat> but I, I wanted to, we have so little time left. But I hope I meet Patrick Swayze on the other side. I better. I put in my time. <laughs> He's wonderful. We all love Patrick Swayze. But I, two things very quickly. Do you believe in soul plans? And then we have a question about suicide. And if that's something that you think um, might be a part of a soul plan, is there something that you might be able to say to speak to that? Um, in, well, in with reincarnation, soul plan implies that you believe in reincarnation. I was actually invited by BBC Radio 4, their Beyond Belief program to talk about this um, um, but what I did because it was the BBC I, I will ref I referenced uh, the research of Dr Ian Stevenson in that where he you know had some incredible reincarnation stories from children uh, especially who would have no preconceived ideas about culture and religion which kind of I believe again are powerful data so it depends if you believe in reincarnation and my personal belief is to believe in it but of course, can't be proved. I just point to research like Dr. Ian Stevenson, which suggests it could well be true. And if there is reincarnation, then I totally believe there's a soul plan, that there's consideration when you get over there. Do you want to go back again? And what have you got to learn now? You know, and some, you know, people want to jump back immediately because they've realized that they want to learn more. So I guess, yeah, I do believe in a soul plan because I, I am inclined now to believe in reincarnation. And if you talk to the likes of Robert Schwartz and um, as I say, reference the research of Dr. Ian Stevenson that's being done, that what he's departed now, I believe, but it, it's being continued at the University of Virginia, isn't it? That department is still looking at it. The data and some of those case histories are extraordinary coming from children who suddenly have a memory of a past life and then they go into the records and they realize that everything that child says is true. Absolutely no way this child could know. 
sometimes in different countries all over the world. And there's no way also the parent, they're too young to be told by their parents what to do. Incredible. So yeah, yeah, I do. Sorry, I've gone on a tangent, but yes. <laughs> That's beautiful. And I just want to tell you that Mary is saying that the spirit world must love you, which <laughs> I'm sure we all feel the same way. Doris is saying White Shores is her podcast. She has some great people and uh, that we know. All, and all, know the, ions, all the IONS team and I torture them with like trying to ask them questions like what's their favorite movie? And it's quite funny when you've got these scientists because I, I, I try to see the human side. So I had Dean Radin on there because White Shores actually, if you're wondering why White Shores, it's because Lord of the Rings, when Frodo goes to the afterlife, it's the undying lands called White Shores. So it's undying. Um, and so I asked them if they could be in Lord of the Rings, what character they would be. And, you know, Dean Radin famously said Spock. <laughs> and he got the wrong. But I also asked people like to give their spiritual mover recommendations. I had a wonderful medium on last week, last week um, who was a former Wall Street money manager and CNBC contributor. I'm sure she'd love to talk to you here, actually. She's called Deborah Diamond and she's a death doula. Oh, we know Deborah, actually. Yeah. She's she's presented to helping parents see yeah them. yeah she was on last yeah she was on i loved her she was interesting she got my favorite movie of all time so she is psychic because oh. I, I get them to guess she was the first to guess the wizard of oz of course oh. <laughs> well that's oh, that's wonderful. kind of a spiritual movie isn't it you're yeah it is. yeah the wizard of oz that dream or is it a near-death experience is it a spiritual journey there's everything there in that dream and at the end we're like dorothy it's within us all, all the time and we just need to learn that. And I think that's what that life is, to realize that we seek out there for what's in us. Um, and I think The Wizard of Oz captures that beautifully. That's um, beautiful, oh my gosh. There's so no place like heaven. There's no place like heaven. And, and heaven is right here at home and our kids are right here every step of the way and they are holding our hands. They're our biggest cheerleaders and they are, leading us to uh home we're still in school though so we're all learning lots of stuff well, what i found also with um the parents that have written to me they all have a dramatic life shift and that they want their life to have meaning and purpose and actually for their soul path the the loss of a child triggers them to be more expansive and to touch lives in a way that they would never have done before um, so maybe it is all part of the soul plan for reaching out, connecting this interconnection between all of us. And I've noticed that with bereaved, bereaved parents, there is this sense of mission. Whereas before they may have been treading water with life and that's no longer the case following the loss of a child. Meaning and purpose becomes everything. Teresa, you wouldn't believe the number of parents who have written incredible books. Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, who have formed foundations to help others. Um, I would say mm -hmm. almost everyone that, that I am in contact with has done something incredible in their child's name. And I agree with you. It does give us purpose. It gives us a reason to be here on earth. Um, and a lot of parents say that although they thought their lives were incredibly perfect before their children passed, now they know that um, they were missing, they were missing that spiritual side. That, that, that um, meaning and purpose. And meaning, and, yes. And yeah. So, um, I, I am just so grateful for you, if, that you were able to come and speak to us. Thank you, Doris, for um, thank you Doris I'm very grateful thank you and you just mentioned about suicide I do want to talk about that because that's such a you mentioned okay, about yes, suicide. Yes. that's a big big issue what happens to suicide and as I say the heaven that you're creating or the hell that you're creating you take it with you and from what I gather that in the other side the, it, it's not a solution because the learning has to continue um, um, but it is sometimes you know, it's it's the hardest thing for the people who, who've been touched by suicide. Um, and I actually spoke to Anne Kasha. I don't know if you've spoken to her, a no. medium. Oh, she yeah. was on, on my podcast. Now she's a medium, a, quite a well-known medium. She works for the Forever Family Foundation and she's Winbridge certified. And um, she was a medium, but her beautiful 
beautiful light of a daughter in her 30s who had everything, was absolutely beautiful, took her own life. And can you imagine if you're a medium and a psychic and you had no knowledge that that would happen, how that affected her? And she actually talks about the spiritual implications of suicide. I'd be happy again to connect you. She's called Ankasha, very articulate, eloquent lady who, as I said, is a medium and a psychic, very well known in her area, um, endorsed scientifically, but then faced the loss of her beautiful daughter who was looks like an angel, actually beautifully blonde. And there's video that she shares of her singing in a car, happy, who took her own life in her mid thirties. And to imagine if that happened, if you were a medium and a psychic and you didn't know that your daughter, you didn't pick up on your own daughter's unhappiness. And she talks about the journey of that in a, and, and, and how the suicide, she understands it. And I, I, she says it far better than I can. As I say, people have been on that road. She's called Anne Kasha. Well, we'll definitely look into having her come and speak. And I, I truly appreciate you speaking to us. And I just want to say, uh, Galen is saying, I had chills during this entire presentation. Oh. Iris is saying, absolutely wonderful. Um, Antoinette is saying, having a relationship with my child is my goal and focus each day. Thank you. Vanna is saying, spot on, mission for heal a meaning and purpose. Thank you. And uh, Debbie saying, thank you so much. This was wonderful. So I, um, I, what we do at the end is we always ask everyone to unmute themselves and say thank you and goodbye. Irene, you've already unmuted yes. everyone. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Oh, My heart is going out to you. Talk so to helpful. your children thank every you. day. Thank Talk to your cheers. children every day. They are alive somewhere. I don't know where, but they are alive. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful rest Thanks. of the day. And I will.